Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, show me the shortness of my time and the nearness of eternity, so I do not fail to redeem the time. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, every so often we see to see and hear headlines like this. Dozens of people gunned down in a mosque in Christ Church in New Zealand. Three died in floods on the Niagara and the Missouri rivers. We hear about mass shootings. We hear about murders, all sorts of natural disasters. From time to time, we hear about tsunamis taking out thousands of people out in the Far East. Calamity after calamity after calamity. What do you think when you hear about such things? Does it ever make you wonder why such things like that happen? Does it make you question God? Why do these things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? And you know, people of God throughout the entire history of the world have always had questions like that. The people of Jesus' Jesus day had questions like that when calamity came their way. And when it did, Jesus had the answer, and he still has it for us today. As we look at God's word before us this morning in the gospel lesson, Jesus tells us to consider calamity's call. Repent. Repent, all of you, and repent while there is still time. In our text, Jesus had been preaching and teaching to many people just before he was about to embark on his journey to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. People were coming to him with many different questions, many different diseases. Jesus took the opportunity to teach and to heal. And we're told in our text that at this time, there were some present who decided to tell Jesus about a couple of calamities. First of all, about one, some Galileans who were at the temple in Jerusalem, and Pontius Pilate came and slaughtered them inside the temple. It was such a slaughter that their blood mingled with the blood of the sacrifices that there were there in the temple, desecrating that holy place. It was a brutal, a gory situation. And so they were telling people, they're telling Jesus about this. History doesn't record this issue for us. We only find it in the Bible. But that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It wasn't uncommon in the Roman Empire at that time, or really in any civilization, that when you saw things or things like this happen, especially with a ruler, they were kind of erased from the history books. But then the Pharisees, Jesus' enemies, they didn't stop with that story. Okay, actually, Jesus heard that, and then he says, Hey, what about this one? He said, what about those 18 who were killed in Jerusalem when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? And then, again, a tragedy. And Jesus said, I know what you're thinking. He said, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the people who were living in Jerusalem? This is what the Pharisees were thinking. God was punishing the individuals involved in these calamities because of some particular sin. Do you ever feel that way when we see or hear about certain calamities 
going on that day. Some people might think that with that slaughter at the mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand, that God was punishing Muslims because they didn't worship him. Jesus said, no. Those people were not any worse sinners than any other, or you and me. Going back in the past 40 years, you might remember when AIDS was breaking out, and many people were saying that that horrible disease, God was wreaking his punishment on the gay community. Jesus would say, no. Not excusing the sin, but he, but saying, those people are not worse sinners than you or me. Basically, what Jesus is telling us, when we see and hear about calamity, God is getting our attention. God is telling you and me this. We live in a sinful world. And while we might want to have an explanation of why God does these things, he doesn't explain himself. In fact, you might remember Job, that great man of faith in the Old Testament, when he faced calamity in his own life and demanded an explanation from God, God called him to task. And he said, who are you to question me? I created everything. I created you. You couldn't even begin to understand if I told you. Your job is to trust that I know what I'm doing, and I'll work all things for the good of those who love me. That's the only explanation that God gives us. And so calamity, when it comes, God gets our attention, and he says this, you are a sinner. I am a sinner. And God says, this is a call for repentance. And yes, there is a need for repentance. Each and every one of us. We so often like to grade our sins or com in comparison to others. And why is it that your sinful nature and mine likes to think this? My sins aren't as bad as that of others. My sins, God can actually overlook and maybe even chuckle at them a little bit and turn his back on them. No. All sin damns. All sin condemns us to hell. The wages that our sin earned are death and hell. And God says, repent. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. Repentance is a change of mind that has worked after God's law condemns us as lost and condemned creatures and works sorrow over our sin. It worked a change of mind through the gospel. As we leave those sins at the feet of Jesus, covered with his holy, precious blood, and we trust in God's forgiveness. Repentance is really the lifeblood, the breathing apparatus of the Christian, of you and me. Every single day, we remember our baptism, confessing our sins, trusting in Jesus for forgiveness. As Luther likes to say in the explanation to holy baptism in the catechism, he says that we are to daily drown the old Adam the sinful nature, grab him by the hair and hold him under the waters of baptism. And he says, but that rascal keeps popping up his ugly head every single day. And so repentance is a necessity every single day. That's what God reminds us of with calamity. We are sinners. There's a need to repent. All of us. And then he tells us we are to do that while there is still time. After Jesus was talking about these calamities and God's call to repentance, he then told a parable. He said, A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it, but he did not find any. 
So he said to the gardener, For three years now I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I have found none. Cut it down. Why even let it use up the soil? But the gardener replied to him, Sir, leave it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put fertilizer on it. If it produces fruit next year, fine, but if not, then cut it down. In this parable, Jesus teaches us a valuable lesson. In the parable, we hear about the fig tree. And the fig tree is you and me. Okay? And then he talks about the man who owned the vineyard. God the Father. And then he talks about the garden, who is Jesus. The owner comes in to the, the garden, the vineyard, looking at the fig tree. Expecting fruit, expecting life. He sees it. He says, cut it down. The gardener says, please wait. He says, give me a year's time. Let me dig around it. Let me take the weeds away. Let me put some fertilizer on it. And if it starts to produce fruit, then fine. But if not, then let's cut it down. Let's, let's be patient. We see Jesus as our mediator, our go-between, our defender. We see in his patience where we're reminded that God does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That God wants all to be saved. But while God is patient, and Scripture reminds us constantly that our Heavenly Father is patient, Jesus also teaches us here, let's not abuse that patience of God. Let's not take the attitude that I can let my sinful nature go off and do whatever it wants and act any way it wants, and yeah, I'm going to have time to come back and change it all. No, we don't know when our Lord will return. Jesus says repentance is necessary for all of us. What a blessed truth we have that while we're sinners, Jesus has come and has taken that sin away. That eternal life is ours. And in our life of repentance, our daily life of repentance, we have his encouragement to daily bring those sins to him and leave them at his feet, knowing that those sins are removed as far as the east is from the west and the north is from the south. What a blessed truth. We're going to be hearing it coming up soon during Holy Week. You might remember as the Jewish leaders were standing before Pontius Pilate and were crying out for Jesus to be crucified crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And the people said, those Jewish people said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Do you think that all the calamity that the Jewish people have encountered in the 2,000 years since that some special punishment from God because of that? What we learn from today's text is no. Calamities like that, God speaks to us directly. He gets our attention. He grabs us by the shoulders and he says, repent. Repent, all of you. Repent while there is still time. Today, God's mercy calls you to wash it over his face. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. You can find those words on page 41 in the front of the hymn. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated for the collection of the offerings. 